Think positively. That imperative to put a plus sign inside our minds has taken much of the world like a fever. It runs through pop culture, religion, business, virtually every facet of modern life we survey. But Mitch Horowitz's new book, One Simple Idea, looks deeper. He digs into the roots and the story behind the sensation. Mitch joined me to talk about the hidden history behind positive thinking, which we know by many names, including the Law of Attraction, The Secret, and others. So to begin with, Mitch, what is this one simple idea? The essential belief of positive thinking is that thoughts are causative, that what we think actually has a concrete effect on our experiences and circumstances, not just in a psychological way, but in a, an objective and, and material way. Uh, this idea had its earliest stirrings uh, in the New England states of America, um, starting in about the 1830s with the advent of what was called the mental healing movement. And there were a variety of people experimenting in New England in particular, a uh, clockmaker named Phineas Quimby, who lived in the state of Maine, uh, and they were attempting their own protocols and experiments around using prayer and visualization and, and different hypnotic states or trance states to heal the body. Uh, they were at times experimenting with ideas that had crossed over from Europe uh, that were called mesmerism. Uh, there was a, a Viennese healer named Franz Anton Mesmer who theorized that all of life was suffused with this invisible etheric fluid, which Mesmer called animal magnetism, and that if a person could be placed into a trance state or mesmeric state, this later became the practice that we call hypnotism, uh, his or her animal magnetism could be realigned and illnesses could be cured. Uh, Mesmer's students tended to edge away from the idea of animal magnetism, and they were struggling more and more to understand uh, some of the cures that seemed to occur during these mesmeric trance states as products of the mind, and they were struggling with a language uh, to describe their earliest conceptions of the subconscious mind or the subliminal mind, what later became called the, the unconscious mind. But many of the people who were experimenting with these methods were religious as well, and they believed that these mental cures were not just a product of some unseen thinking faculty within us, but they were a product of divine laws as well. And that's where Swedenborg comes in. Emanuel Swedenborg was a scientist and mystic in Sweden uh, who lived and worked in the 1700s, and he theorized that man lived in two worlds. We lived in the material world that we experience day to day, and we lived in an invisible cosmic world where there were all kinds of cosmic laws and forces that we could become sensitized to that could have an effect on us here on Earth. So the mental healing folks were dealing with ideas from mesmerism, ideas from Swedenborgianism, and they thought that through the mind we could channel some divine force that would heal the body. It was only later in the 19th century that these ideas expanded out of the realm of healing and more towards material things than you mentioned the law of attraction. The law of attraction, unusually enough, first uh, was coined as a phrase in America in the mid-1850s by a medium named Andrew Jackson Davis, who, among other things, was imbibing the works of Swedenborg. And Davis believed and wrote that um, there was a law of attraction that governed uh, the kinds of spirit visitors that could be summoned up during seances. Uh, based on the character and the personality traits of the people seated around the seance table and that the law of attraction would also determine which tier of the afterlife we would go to based on the character traits that we showed here on earth. So the law of attraction uh, in its original inception was thought to be this law that determined basically what realm of the spirit world we belong to, what realm of the spirit world we could converse with based upon our moral and ethical behavior here on earth. It was only much later, uh, as we got into the 1890s and uh, the early 20th century, that law of attraction as a term uh, began to get used as a law of cause and effect, as a law of like attracts like, uh, right here on earth, so that if we put out thoughts of prosperity, we would receive prosperity. If we put out thoughts of wellness, we would receive wellness, and so on and so forth. And it became the most popular catchphrase of the positive thinking movement. It wasn't really uh, known until more or less the, the 1890s, late 1890s, um, as a law of mental cause and effect. But now uh, the phrase itself is uh, better known probably than any other to ever have emerged from that movement. 
You know, with the surge in popularity of the law of attraction and thoughts as things that seems almost ubiquitous today, it's just really great to get the historical threads of its source. Do you think it came initially from petitionary prayer or was it that with a combination of shamanistic elements or is it just too tough to guess what ushered in this transition from conventional religion into new age forms? Well, that's a very good question, and I've worked very hard to try to trace out that family tree. There are there are different aspects of the mental healing and the positive thinking ideal that appear in other traditions. You, know, you mentioned petitionary prayer and shamanism. There are also certain ancient hermetic writings that you know have strands and threads of these ideas, but there's not necessarily a family tree of connection among them. The 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 clearest ideas, the clearest thread of ideas that the mental healing folks were were taking in, uh, according to their own writings and statements, were Mesmer and Swedenborg. And, and, and they were transforming Mesmer's ideas dramatically and bringing their own insights to them. And uh, in particular, there was a contemporary of Phineas Quimby's named Warren Felt Evans, who had been a, a, a Methodist minister, but he left the Methodist pulpit to explore the mystical ideas of Swedenborg. And Evans really hit upon the core methodology of positive thinking. He wrote in his journals um, in the 1850s and early 1860s that thought backed by faith is the engine of creation, that uh, faith in a sense, is a way in which we can come in touch with and commune with God's intentions on earth, and that if we can combine a genuine and integral faith with our own mental pictures and visualizations, we can effectively come to know God's will, convey our will to the divine, and behave as engines of creation ourselves, or little capillaries or veins of of creation. Uh, we can channel the will of the Creator. And and he never spoke quite in terms of intercessory prayer or petitionary prayer, but he spoke more in terms of prayer therapy, entering into this state of faith and mental visualization and using that as a springboard to help outpicture one's desires into the world. So these folks, you know, I mean, remember they were living in rural areas in, in New England. They didn't have access to libraries or translations in which they could have come in touch with all the world's spiritual traditions. So to a very great extent, they were out there on their own. They were reading scripture. They were reading Swedenborg. They, Mesmer had written very little, so they were hearing sometimes from um, students from England or France who crossed the Atlantic and were teaching mesmerism, and they this was very much a homegrown philosophy. These folks were really out there uh, on their own. In reading your book, one of the things that popped into my head was that if you strip away the ornamentation, underneath there's a lot of similarity between what Aleister Crowley espoused and positive thought. A lot of similarity between the means of occult magic and positive thinking, occult magic saying that nature is available to be influenced and brought into alignment with our will and preferences, and that's very similar to the positive thought movement and the law of attraction in asserting that thoughts become things, that we can create our own reality. Do you think there's a substantial difference at their core, or does it feel more like they're siblings? or even twins just dressed up in different clothing? That's, that's a wonderful question and insight, and, and you're the only person I've spoken to that's, that's framed that insight with that, that degree of, of clarity, and it's very incisive and interesting. In a sense, all of modern metaphysics has bent to the ideas of new thought or positive thinking. Every variant of practical mysticism or the occult, in whatever permutation or whatever outer dressing, deals with this idea of the manifestation of one's will or thought or desires. And so you'll find that in Aleister Crowley. You'll find that in Rhonda Byrne. You'll find that in, uh, to, 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 to a certain extent, although with a very different tone, in Warren Felt Evans and in some of the progenitors of, of positive thinking. And it, it, it hits upon a very interesting question and, and sort of attention. I mean, first of all, what it shows first and foremost is that the, this mind power metaphysics has come to envelop
all mystical and new age and alternative spiritual cultures and not a few evangelical cultures as well. It, 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 this idea that thoughts are things, which is a phrase that belongs to an American journalist, Prentice Mulford, who was another sort of lost pioneer of positive thinking. This idea that thoughts are things is sort of a central principle that traverses the entire Western spiritual culture in all of its mystical variants. Um, and, and I say mystical, but it really ranges from new age, culture over to certain reaches of, of the evangelical culture. It's just everywhere. And you will certainly find different intonations and different emphases and different phrases uh, with which it's used. A figure like Norman Vincent Peale, for example, who wrote the book The Power of Positive Thinking, he uses the phrase thoughts or things. Peale felt that whatever we did had to be in line with scriptural ethics or we would, we would suffer the consequence. Crowley, on the other hand, who was very interested in the imposition of will, felt that uh, we were not bound by scriptural ethics. He didn't recognize that uh, uh, way of thinking. Uh, he believed that acting with self-will from a higher self, uh, he did speak in terms of love, of course, but he spoke in terms of cultivating a true self, a higher self, and acting from that will was the purpose of life and that all man's portent lay in that direction. So your observation is right. I wrestle with it myself today, right here and now, because the great tension that exists within all of religion is whether whose will, you know, whose will are we imposing? And what is this true self? What is this 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 higher self? And and what are the dangers that, that the, the higher self uh, becomes nothing but a proxy for narcissism. Ralph Waldo Emerson wrestled with these things. You know, Emerson wrote his great essay, Self-Reliance, which echoes some of the very themes that we're talking about. And Emerson felt that there, the, to reach uh, his proper state, all men, all of us, all men and women, needed to cultivate some sort of higher, truer self from which we could act with the will of creation. Emerson wrote about this further in an essay of his called Spiritual Laws, where he believed that man, in order to realize his potential, had to put himself in the gulf stream of divine will, and that if you could find your way into that center of natural law, you could be lifted by its winds. Some of the idealist philosophers also wrote about this. I think that view is the one that I sympathize with personally, because it charts a course between um, all these different currents that we're talking about. You know, it's, it's, it's the idea of cultivating my true will, consequences be damned, is a very dangerous recipe for narcissism because, yes, I do think we have a true and higher self, but there's a lot else in us than just that. We, we have a lot of emotional conflicts crisscrossing through us, and they will surprise us and blindside us and direct us to do things that we didn't think we were capable of doing and that we might not want to do. Man is not in control of his faculties, which is a chief problem in cultivating a sense of higher self. It's hard. It's simple at one hand, and it's very, very hard on another. There's a lot crisscrossing through us that we don't recognize or understand, and I think that's what Emerson was trying to deal with. He was trying to navigate this tension that, that, that you've described between God's will and man's will. And that's, that's worthy of a lifelong search. I love that your book goes there as well, and that you so readily engage in that question. I would also put the word self in quotes, because I know personally, I'm a bundle of contradictions, and they all want the steering wheel at any given moment. You know, myself is comprised of numerous lesser selves. So then you get the question of which one would get to make its thoughts into things. You astutely point out that these are the kinds of questions that didn't always get asked and perhaps are still not posed. But do you feel that this movement is being pressed on those questions more forcefully now? Does it have an intelligent response to that kind of criticism? Those are great questions. And I think positive thinking, I, I value it so much, and I love the philosophy. I exist within the philosophy. New thought and positive thinking are the culture, the background, the life that I operate in and come from. So when I say this, what, when I make this criticism, I make it from the inside, not from the outside. This philosophy has failed to grow and develop. Um, it, 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 it hasn't been self-scrutinizing enough. It hasn't uh, asked itself enough questions. And sometimes within New Thought, there's a little bit of an anti-intellectual quality where people 
would describe our conversation that we're having right now as you know too much from the neck up, you know too much thinking, not enough feeling, you know, and 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 too didactic, too pedantic. Um, I think positive thinking, the positive thinking communities ranging from the New Age to the evangelical culture, need to ask themselves tougher questions, need to be part of conversations like this, need to start conversations like this themselves. Um, I think there's been a lot of blind alleys and dead ends in positive thinking. I I tremendously respect the Swedenborg thinker Warren Felt Evans, but as I write in the book, and Evans was a remarkable man in many, many, many ways, and he did things in life that I couldn't have done. So when I criticize him, I'm not putting myself above him. Um, but I think he misread Swedenborg, and he, he, he came up with this idea that all of life is subject to the laws of our mind, and from that idea, we got this kind of overarching expression of the law of attraction, this notion that everything uh, that that exists uh, has an, an antecedent in our thoughts. I think that's a very, very big mistake and a real dead end. Just as we individually live under internal forces, we live under many external forces. Uh, we li- I believe we live under accident. We live under physical limitations. We die. We obviously even live under mortality. Uh, we live under happenstance. If a person lives on an earthquake fault, they might get hurt, and that's not going to be their fault. My Mind is one really remarkable, extraordinary force, and I believe a metaphysical force that we live under, among many, many others. So I think the positive thinking movement doesn't need to release or jettison any of its extraordinary insights, but it needs to broaden them to understand that we don't live under one mental super law. No serious or thoughtful person, I think, can sustain that belief over a lifetime. We live under many forces, of which the mind is one. And I think our experiments will be deeper deeper and, and richer if we proceed from that point. The positive thinking movement also needs a better understanding of some of the science that's going on today that's validating some of the insights of positive thinking. We don't have time to go into all of it, but insights in neurobiology, uh, in new placebo studies, and in the hard sciences, including in quantum physics experiments, are really extraordinary. And there's a wrap out there in the mainstream culture that New Age people misrepresent Uh, quantum physics experiments don't understand it or soft-headed about it or backward about it. The rap is is fair only up to the point that that those of us in the alternative spiritual culture don't cultivate a good understanding of these things. Sometimes we don't, and sometimes we deserve the criticism. But I was on an Irish talk show yesterday, and I began to talk about quantum physics, and the host, who was a good guy, kind of exploded at me and said, oh, that's all baloney. You people can use quantum physics to explain anything. And I said, no, no. There is actually room for a really intelligent discussion between serious people in the metaphysical world and, and patient people <laughs> within the world of quantum physics. <laughs> and I want, to, I want to cultivate that discussion. I don't want that discussion to be squelched. I don't want that discussion to be, to be waylaid before it's even occurred. That discussion should occur. But for it to occur means those of us in the alternative spiritual culture need to know what we're talking about. I always think the astrologer should know a little something about astronomy, maybe more than a little something. The the positive thinking person should know something about what's going on in placebo studies, what's going on seriously in quantum physics, not just repetitions through other New Age sources that we want to hear. So I think that the, the movement needs to grow up. Uh, the movement needs to take itself more seriously and needs to rethink this idea of an overarching law of attraction. It's a fabulous tangle, really. I mean, I totally agree with the methodological pluralism that you're describing there. I think that one of the great things about being a human right now is all of these disciplines and domains available to us. On that note, you mentioned in your book some ESP studies. And from my point of view, the proof of certain psi phenomena is no longer disputable. Dean Radin's work as an example, could you talk about this? The fact that the battle is not statistically establishing the reality of some psi features. It's more toward changing worldviews. It's modifying the cultural conversation like the show you were on in Ireland. Can you talk about the cultural constrictions placed on the available data? Well, you know, there, there. I do write in the book about how some uh, of the data to emerge from the past century's ESP research supports the contention that there's some non-physical aspect to the mind. And um, not only from the turn of the century, but going up through the, I look at data from the 1980s, and I comment on some more recent data that's been amassed by Dean Radin, who you mentioned. Um, 
and I agree with you that that there is enough laboratory data produced over enough years in very rigorously scrutinized conditions so that there's no question that there's some sort of anomalous transfer of information in laboratory settings. Whatever that is deserves further inquiry. Um, there are a, a small, precious handful of critics who have said they ardently refuse to believe in the existence of ESP, but they acknowledge, they acknowledge that there is data that shows some kind of anomalous information transfer. And I can, I can live with that criticism. I can stand with that criticism. I mean, somebody doesn't have to. I, I do believe that the ESP thesis is correct, but if somebody comes to me and says, no, it's, it's not correct, but I recognize that there's a lot of data that's there that deserves further inquiry, we can have a conversation. I welcome it. I welcome yeah. it. The problem we face in our culture is that there is an unprincipled, um, I think almost grossly caricatured skepticism that has, in the public arena, won the debate, that is victorious, that has managed to communicate to journalists and academics that not only does this clinical data not exist, but it's filled with holes and it's never been replicated and you can rest assured there's nothing there to look at. So that on occasions when mainstream media sources and opinion making media will cover developments in sci research as happened a couple of years ago for example when the new york times and other important media outlets covered experiments on precognition that a psychiatrist named Daryl Bem was conducting at Cornell, when they cover it, they cover it only as a controversy. The findings are not reported. The controversy is reported. And they will essentially report it as a debate over whether this research should be going on at all on college campuses, not what the research found uh, or not even a, a kind of back and forth as to what the researcher says and what the critics say, but rather the news coverage itself, the headline is controversy, not finding and, well, some people don't accept it and here's where we have to go next according to the uh, researchers, uh, here's, where, here's where the research was wrong according to the critics. That would be a step forward. They will just cover it as a controversy as to why cyclical research is going on at a place like Cornell. So in that sense, the skeptics have won you know, uh, for the time being. Of course, life is ever-changing, so as soon as somebody wins, that's usually the indication that a current of some sort is about to reverse itself. So I've told friends of mine, just watch. You know, there'll be some sort of a resurgence, uh, perhaps, in, in, in psychical research in the next five, ten years or something like that, if the funding is there. Um, I had a, the book, my book was reviewed in Business Week uh, last week, and it was a good review, but the writer who, again, you know, he, he made some good and cogent points, but he mentioned that I reference parapsychological and ESP research in my book and that that's where I'm going to lose readers because I'm, I'm, I'm talking about experiments that have never been replicated. Now, he gets that information that these experiments have never been replicated from the critics who have established it as uh, a reliably repeated fact, but it's, 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 it's not a reliable fact. Uh, the parapsychological data that J.B. Ryan amassed was repeated over a period of about 60 years. There have been numerous, numerous repetitions, very highly and closely scrutinized by legitimate skeptics um, of uh, experiments called the Gansfeld experiments, which involve testing whether sensory deprivation, like sitting in a, uh, a silent sound booth, um, will heighten uh, apparent instances of precognition. Those experiments have been repeated and, and analyzed and meta-analyzed uh, across the space of many years. And a parapsychologist named Charles Onerton wrote a joint paper um, with a, a very principled skeptic named Ray Hyman, uh, in which they, they both agreed to disagree about the existence of ESP, but they agreed that the results from these repeat experiments um, were represented legitimately arrived at uh, uh, data that withstood scrutiny, juried data. So forgive me for this digression, but the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, when the skeptics say that the ESP data has never been repeated, has never stood up to scrutiny, um, there just aren't facts at the back of that. But they repeat it as facts yeah. because they have been deeply skilled at communicating this to journalists and academics. So in that sense, uh, they've won the war of opinion. We've lost. 
those of us who want to take parapsychological research seriously have lost. That might reverse itself in 10 years. You know, I, I don't know. But I think um, we have to take it very seriously that that's, that's where we are. Um, it's unfortunate because I think it closes down debate, but uh, this research is unfortunately not taken seriously. So I acknowledge in the book that the, the research I'm citing, while I think it's very legitimate, has not uh, won the war of opinion, so it's not going to convince anybody <laughs> of my thesis that um, uh, that there is some sort of non-physical agency to the mind. I wonder if you saw this open letter last week where 70 or 80 scientists signed a letter in one of the main journals asking for exactly what you're describing, objective empirical studies. That's the kind of gradual aggregating shift that we may see over the course of decades. How optimistic or pessimistic are you about that rate of change? Sometimes it feels like we get the worst of both. On one hand, pathological skepticism. On the other hand, crazy new age stuff that's equally unhelpful. And then somewhere in the middle is this research you're describing, which is perplexing to say the least. Are things now worse or better than they have been in the past? And how optimistic are you that a shift is going to occur in your lifetime? Mm. Well, I would say, first of all, they're, they're worse now than they were, <laughs> because back in the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, even through the 60s probably, um, J.B. Ryan, uh, who was a, a research psychologist at Duke University who pioneered modern ESP research in the United States was one of the most talked about and widely respected scientists in America. He was widely quoted. He was feted in national media. Uh, he was a respected figure. He had a tremendous capacity for public communication. He knew how to handle himself on the public stage. And he was, in many respects, a great scientist. Um, who had uh, the resources and the prestige of a great university at his back. Uh, times have changed. Uh, today you'll hear uh, J.B. Ryan's name almost nowhere. And legitimate people, serious uh, scientists of tremendous intellect and integrity who do engage in parapsychological research, and I'm thinking, for example, of Dean Radin at the Institute for Noetic Sciences, Daryl Bem at Cornell, um, People will go after them on Wikipedia and on the Internet, and it's hard for them to get uh, coverage within mainstream publications, again, that doesn't just cover the controversy, basically, rather than covering what they're doing with a reasonable back and forth from, from legitimate critics. Um, yeah. So the, the situation, I would say, is pretty bad, and uh, it is worse than it's been. And um, I, l those are among my reasons for saying that the skeptics uh, or, or compromised skeptics, uh, in many cases, have won the war of opinion. Um, I don't see any great reason to be hopeful other than the fact that life tends to go cyclically. Uh, the tide rushes in and, and, and flows out. And as soon as one argument seems to prevail, as soon as one point of view seems to prevail, um, another uh, counterpoint appears to rise. Um, uh, sort of self-satisfied Victorian Christianity found itself having to contend with Darwinism at some point. And then you know, uh, there, there are critics who, who ably responded uh, in certain respects to Darwinism. Today, there's a strain of a, a certain, I would say, very didactic, narrow materialism uh, that has, again, made tremendous inroads and strides into the media through a combination of uh, wit and debate skills, <laughs> and, and that that uh, a, a kind of narrowly conceived materialism has, I think, prevailed in in, in the the realm of philosophy, and in and in a good deal of our public discussion about religion. But again, as soon as some tendency prevails, whether it's a compromised skepticism towards parapsychological research or a deeply witty and narrowly conceived materialism, usually, usually, uh, just because of the uh, nature of things, some page seems to turn and, and another generation or another set of ideas seems to enter. So I'm not writing off the possibility that in the next five, ten years we may see some sort of a renewal of, of serious interest in alternative spirituality. It may come from the very uh, impeccable and, and persuasive research that's being done right now into 
um, the physical benefits of meditation. The physical benefits of meditation, um, which is essentially a spiritual practice, uh, are, are being documented in ways that are that are getting taken seriously, and that may crack open the door, may crack open the door to a new um, iteration of, of research into uh, parapsychology. Sometimes it seems that mystics and the esoterically inclined are so occupied with inward practices that they're less interested in the skillful presentation of what they experience, the data that they gather by conducting contemplative practice. Do you think that's one of the factors that keeps this enterprise limited? Well, that's a good question, and I agree with you. I, 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 I do think that the people who dwell within the alternative spiritual culture um, are r rarely skilled at communicating with the mainstream nowadays. Uh, J.B. Ryan, the parapsychologist, was very skilled at uh, conveying his research to mainstream people. Um, there have been other figures, less well-known spiritual thinkers, like a man named Vernon Howard, who I admire greatly and write about in the book. He was a spiritual philosopher who died in 1992. I always felt that he was very gifted and skilled at communicating with people from any reach or any walk of life. I do think it's valuable. Um, I don't think the insularity or a withdrawal from mainstream life is practical or is necessary or is helpful. Um, I do think that we should be able to carry on conversations uh, across the culture. Um, years ago, um, there was a scandal in the Clinton White House when it was reported that Hillary Clinton was having some sort of spiritual sessions with the New Age teacher, Gene Houston, uh, somebody who I have a lot of respect for, and Bob Woodward wrote about this in the Washington Post, and these things were depicted as seances and uh, uh, you know, weird <laughs> counter sessions or what have you, and I, I feel that um, nobody was able to respond adequately at the time and say, look... Um, uh, that's not what was going on at all, you know, and, and, and just w walk him through whatever they were doing, whether it was visualization or creativity exercises, things that you, you know, find going on at most corporate retreats and such. Um, I do think that it's helpful to be able to talk to the mainstream because, for one thing, I want to see people in this culture have a sense of options, and I don't want any path of inquiry to get stigmatized. And um, if New Age ideas get stigmatized, um, they become less available as an option to people who might be genuinely helped by them. So I, I want to see, for various reasons, um, those of us in the New Age spiritual culture be able to talk to the mainstream. So that's, that's something that, that I think should be encouraged. One of the things I love about your book and your work is that it is conducted in the mainstream and it's bringing up the quality of the conversation. Two captivating figures in your book that I'd love to get your thoughts on. One is Ronald Reagan and the other one that I just love is Sherman Helmsley. Can you touch on each of them respectively? Sure. Uh, two, two figures who I care a lot about actually. Um, I, I discovered Sherman Helmsley, uh, let it be known very indirectly, in an interview in TV Guide magazine in 1982, that great esoteric journal, um, that he was a great fan and admirer of a new thought uh, occult book called The Kabbalion, which some of your listeners will have heard of. Uh, it was produced um, in the early 1900s by a man named William Walker Atkinson, uh, who wrote under a pseudonym Three Initiates. And uh, it's a very intriguing book. It's it's a book, probably one of the most influential books of occult philosophy ever written, certainly the most influential, I think, of the 20th century, at least measured by readership, um, filled with interesting ideas. <clears throat> I was proud to recently record an audio edition of it. And um, Hemsley, the actor who became world famous playing George Jefferson on The Jeffersons, he swore by the book. He said there was a man who gave him the book when he was young. He wouldn't identify who the man was. And uh, and it changed everything for him. And actually, at first, Hemsley, who was intensely private, wouldn't tell uh, this TV Guide reporter what book he was talking about. He He sort of grumbled in a manner worthy of George Jefferson that he didn't want to advertise any book. But his uh, housemate uh, told the TV Guide reporter that the Kabbalion was the book that, that, that Hemsley was talking about. And it was just very interesting because Hemsley was an intensely private guy, very successful actor, great comedic actor. 
very deeply interested in Kabbalah meditation, uh, the Kabbalion, New Thought. And I was, I was touched by how he structured his life uh, with a lot of integrity, it seemed to me, at least from a distance. He was asked by a reporter why he didn't hang around Hollywood parties and restaurants, and he said, nothing goes on there. Everything that really matters goes on in the mind. And um, I was touched by that statement. I didn't think the guy was a recluse. He had just chosen a more private life while at the same time pursuing a career as, a, as an actor. And you find a lot of artists who are both introverts and extroverts. The same thing was true of Johnny Carson. You put him in front of a camera, and he just lit up. You know, he was extraordinary. He could speak extemporaneously with such genius and had such great comedic timing, but in his private life, he was an intensely private person, almost to the point of being a recluse. And uh, that shouldn't surprise us because that's a that's a particular personality type. There are people who enjoy being in public, but then they want to sort of retreat uh, into into private life. And uh, I sympathize with that uh, personality trait. So that was Sherman Hemsley and, and where he figured into our alternative spiritual history. <laughs> um, Reagan was a very interesting case, and that part of the book has gotten a lot of attention. Biographers and journalists are always puzzling who Reagan was. You know, who was the man behind the curtain? Who was the inner man? And they they wonder, was there even an inner man? And my contention is that you can't understand Reagan unless you understand him as a product of the positive thinking culture. All this mind power mysticism permeated Reagan's speeches and writings, many of which he at least wrote the first draft of when he was younger, certainly. Uh, from the 1950s up through his presidency in the 1980s, Reagan was using pull phrases from positive thinking. And I also I go into this in great detail in the book, and I've written about it elsewhere, including the Washington Post and Salon and other mainstream places. I found absolutely telltale signs that Reagan, in some of his speeches, was borrowing phrases and ideas from the occult scholar Manley P. Hall, which was an extraordinary discovery to me. It blew me away, absolutely blew me away. And it's unmistakable because mm -hmm. there's a confluence not only of ideas but of specific phraseology and uh, it all just holds up and I, I go through this argument with, with a great degree of care uh, in the book and, and, ha and have argued it elsewhere. So Reagan... Um, while he was many things and can't be classified in any one way, um, the three decades of his life that he spent in Hollywood left a very, very deep impression on him, uh, not only in terms of his politics and, and his work as an actor, which he was proud of, but uh, in terms of the spiritual and social mores of, of, of Southern California. His neighbors uh, were New Agers. They may have been conservative, but they were New Agers. He hung around with people like Gene Dixon and the astrologer Carol Ryder, and he was very comfortable with them and very unembarrassed about those relationships and friendships and uh, it left a very very deep mark on him these are dimensions your book brings to the fore that i think have been absent from some discussions about reagan he didn't shun or become embarrassed by that background you know he celebrated it and remained loyal to it he must have been advised to not broadcast a lot of this stuff like the UFO encounters that he was very open and sharing about, and he never seemed to shrink away from all of that. It seems to make him a profoundly singular political figure in that way. And after reading your treatment of him, it, he made a lot more sense to me. You know, with Manly P. Hall and the esoteric dimension of his spirituality, this vibrant enthusiasm that you describe as fueling everything he did, the puzzle started to come together for me. And I thought, of course, that's what people were responding to, you know? They were resonating with that. And like a tuning fork, he held that over the country. And it was transformative for a lot of people. It almost made me nostalgic for a time when politicians were not as paralyzed with endless calculation of every minute move. Yes, I, I think that's just beautifully put. And, uh, and I, would, I would agree wholeheartedly with everything you just said. Uh, you know, one of the things that really came to touch me about Reagan is how frank and unembarrassed he was about uh, his metaphysical beliefs. And long after the point in his career when he surely would have been advised, uh, Mr. President or Mr. Governor, why don't you cool it when talking about premonitory dreams? You know, he would just be – he would work on these things, you know. And when he was running for the presidency um, in uh, – the 1980 election, he sat down for a very long interview. I think it was a three-hour interview with a freelance journalist named Angela Fox Dunn. This later was reprinted in the Washington Post and all kinds of significant newspapers. And he spoke quite frankly about his relationship with Jean Dixon and about the what he called the foretelling part of her mind, which which was his phrase for the what he 
believed of as the premonitory part of her mind. And I just thought that was such an interesting expression, the foretelling part of her mind. You know, he had obviously dwelt on this for a little while. You know, he wasn't using garden variety phraseology. And he would speak about um, being proud of being an Aquarius on the Zodiac Wheel. <laughs> and uh, he would talk to reporters, including a reporter from the Wall Street Journal when he was governor of California, about having witnessed UFOs. Um, again, you know, critics look at this stuff and they roll their eyes and they think, oh, God, you know, it's worse than we thought. It's worse than we thought. The guy's a nut, you know. Say what you will. He was frank, and there was something I found deeply admirable about how unembarrassed he was to talk about all this stuff. And if you read the interviews, he could talk about it with a, a great deal of uh, uh, alacrity and 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 articulateness. And I. I was touched to read it. Uh, uh, again, it would give the shivers to, to critics of Reagan, and I've had lots of people talk to me about this material and say, oh, my God, you know, it's worse than I ever thought. And, of course, first of all, that depends on one's perspective. You know, we, we could have a big discussion about New Age beliefs and whether they're a legitimate religious expression. I do believe they're a legitimate religious expression, and, you know, I, I feel I could I could defend that point of view and as much as I could defend the positive thinking outlook. But I understand the attitudes that are out there. Um, leaving that aside, uh, the fact that he was in a, such a sensitive and public position and that he would speak so transparently about these things um, after, again, he had surely been advised at one point or another not to, I thought was quite refreshing and quite different from the norm in, in most of our political culture. Mitch, I know you have to go, but I want to be sure to let everyone know where they can get the book, One Simple Idea. Oh, well, the book is available just anywhere that, that you can buy books. Uh, it's One Simple Idea, How Positive Thinking Reshaped Modern Life. You can find it at uh, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, independent bookstores, anywhere you buy books. Um, it's out there. <laughs> Mitch, thanks so much for being so generous with your time. I greatly enjoyed it. Mitch Horowitz is author of One Simple Idea and also Occult America. <laughs>